Welcome to the ICANN APEC TWN Engagement Forum. This is the second day section. Uh, we would like to remind you that please turn off your uh, please turn your mobile phone to the silent mode. <coughs> and this for uh, this session will be live streamed and recorded. If you have if you need, you can check our website for further information. And now, please welcome our CEO of TWN, Kenny Huang, to give us a brief speech and introduction to our keynote speakers today. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my honor to introduce today's uh, keynote speaker. Uh, the first keynote speaker delivered by Paul Wilson, Director General of APNIC. And the second one will be David Conroe, CTO of ICANN. So let's welcome Paul Wilson to give the first speech. Thank you, uh, Kenny. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. I don't have a screen in front of me. I'll need to be looking at this screen a little bit. Um, I'm going to be talking this morning about uh, one of our uh, future, now today, uh, registry services. I mean, the, the APNIC um, IP address registry has been running for about 25 years. And of course, the idea of the registry is to tell everyone, the internet public, about who has got uh, control of, who holds the IP addresses that APNIC manages. And that's, um, I think we all know, that's very important for fault finding, for engineering, for network configuration, for security, uh, increasingly the, these days for people outside our traditional community like, uh, like law enforcement and public safety and so on, these people to be able to track down the users of um, of IP addresses, which are the subject of the, uh, of the APNIC registry. But that, that registry has been based on WHOIS for about 25 years, and WHOIS was de designed in the early 1980s. So it's a very old standard, and it's got, um, got serious limitations in terms of, of um, being able to be used for different, um, particularly automated um, applications. So one of the new registry services which uh, APNIC and the other RIRs is working on is called RPKI, or Resource Public Key Infrastructure. Now, I've spoken about this uh, last year in, uh, here in Taipei, um, so I'm, I'm going to be giving a, a technical introduction to RPKI uh, for those who may need that, and also an update on a lot of the actually quite recent developments and changes which have been happening, which show you that RPKI is not really the next generation, it's really happening uh, here and, um, and now today, and it's something that we all need to, to, to take a look at. So uh, what is our PKI? It's, um, it's a PKI, a public key infrastructure for internet resource numbers. That's about creating a cryptographically verifiable system of uh, recording the ownership or the, those who are holding IP addresses and autonomous system numbers. And uh, it's, it's creating mechanisms uh, in particular for routing security. So this is what I'm going to be talking about, but I wanted to uh, just make uh, one brief, um, let's see if I can get this to work. But first, ah, turn the switch. First, congratulations to TW Nick. This is a graph of, of uh, IPv6. Uh, growth in Taiwan. It's congratulations to TW Nick and to all of Taiwan for this quite incredible uh, rise in IPv6. Uh, AP Nick has spent quite a lot of time in the in recent years talking about IPv6 around the region and encouraging deployment. And this is exactly what uh, what we have uh, been dreaming of seeing in um, in different economies of the region. So, starting just in early 2018, there's this beautiful curve, uh, very rapid. Uh, and straight line increase in IPv6 deployment. So uh, Taiwan uh, now is at above 30%. It puts, uh, puts uh, this part of the world in the top 10, definitely, of, of IPv6 deployment around the world. There's something else that's um, quite uh, useful to take a look at. I'm still trying to work this magic wand here. Um, 
if we drill down and look at what's happening in Taiwan, this one just, it goes backwards, it doesn't really go forwards, not very easily. If we drill down and look at what's happening in Taiwan, we see that it's not just um, one or two ISPs, but actually all of the large providers are, are providing some very respectable IPv6 capabilities. So HiNet is at 20% um, now. Emom is the leader at 77%. Taiwan Mobile, Far East um, Telecommunications. Uh, there's a couple of others highlighted there, which are smaller uh, networks, but still respectable, uh, Ambit and, uh, and Tarnet. So I just wanted to mention that again because you might have expected APNIC to be talking once again about, about IPv6. We do that quite often. Uh, congratulations. But back to the agenda. Our PKI. So it's a PKI. It's based on the X509 digital certificate standards for public, private, key security. It's the same standard that's used in S-MIME and HTTPS. So these. This is a technology that we use quite often without necessarily knowing it very, um, very well. But it's been adapted to, so that um, our PKI certificates are X509 certificates which carry the details of the IPv4, IPv6 and ASN resources which are held uh, by the certificate holder. So if you hold this certificate, pri the private key to this certificate, then it verifies that you are the owner, the holder of the IP resources which are documented in the certificate. So you will receive these uh, certificates with your resource allocations from the IP address registry, from APNIC, from TWNIC. And in that sense, the IP address registry, the RIR, the NIR, is the certificate authority for issuing these certificates. The second part of our PKI is not just uh, the holding of the certificates which show, your, uh, show that you have authority for the resources, but also the ability to authorise routing. So there's something called a route origin authorization, a ROA, ROA object. That's something that you as a certificate holder produce and you sign it and it gives you a, um, the ability to authorise your addresses to be routed from a particular autonomous system. Now I'm going backwards again. I would recommend re replacing this, uh, this device <laughs> for the next speaker. <laughs> Our PKI has got uh, several defined objects. Those, um, those resource certificates, as I mentioned, which are issued by the uh, Internet Registry as the, the CA, the Route Origin Authorization, uh, which I described as well. There's a, uh, a third object, actually something that's been proposed through APNIC, which is the, uh, the resource tagged attestation, the RTA, which is something that actually allows you to sign any object, such as a letter, with your digital certificate uh, and having your resources attached to that. So you could have a, um, a letter of authority, for instance, uh, posted uh, or given to your upstream ISP or your peer that, uh, that carries your resources uh, as part of your request to them to route IP addresses. Now I'm sure we all basically know about internet uh, routing, but if we have an autonomous system which has a block of IP addresses, IPv4 in this case, if, the, um, if that autonomous system, if that network is to have its address space routed on the internet, it needs to get that address, those addresses into the global routing tables of the internet in some, in some way. And that's done through announcing the addresses, after which the addresses appear in the, in the routing table. And from that point on, the traffic can flow between the internet and your autonomous system. The thing about this uh, rather now dated uh, system of, of internet routing using BGP is that the mechanism for getting that route into the routing table is not well defined. So there's kind of a question mark as to how your upstream or your peer actually understands that you really do have the right to use those addresses and therefore to receive uh, and to source the traffic. So in fact, kind of um, that system which has got uh, an informal set of informal mechanisms for validation really do uh, raise question marks over the origin of um, and the destination of traffic on the internet uh, routed in this, in this manner. Now these are not very common security breaches, but there have been uh, over the recent years a series of quite serious routing security breaches which are caused exactly by the fact that 
routing to the wrong address block can actually happen fairly readily on the internet. So, so Facebook had a major outage of all of its um, applications back in March of just this year, just a couple of months ago. Uh, Google in 2018 also had a, had a major routage, uh, outing, <laughs> routage, <laughs> routing outage, um, uh, a BGP leak involving um, a particular autonomous system uh, out of Nigeria and out of t China Telecom. Uh, there's a, there is a, quite a list, um, but these are big players who've been affected by routing uh, outages. Amazon, Google, Google. Way back in February 2008 was the first major instance we had where um, Pakistan Telecom announced some YouTube address space, and that, um, that announcement propagated quite widely in the internet at the time, pr uh, bringing, uh, taking YouTube down for much of the internet for quite a period of time. So the routing security is something that, that actually has been an, an issue that definitely needs attention. Um, RPKI is the mechanism that we have um, been developing over some years to assist with that. So how does it work? Well, with a, the use of a ROA, a route origin authorization, that ROA can be provided with your routing announcement to your upstream. So rather than using a letter of authority or a telephone call to someone to say, please believe me, I am who I am, and please route my address space, or providing just a written letter that could be on letterhead, but it's still something that can be forged, that uh, letter of authority can be replaced by a ROA, and that's the digitally signed object that actually uh, you can only produce this ROA if you are the holder, the genuine holder of those IP addresses. And so with that, that ROA, uh, providing the, the authorization for you to originate the address space that you're using, the, uh, everyone can be happy. The, the, uh, uh, the traffic, at least between your upstream and your, and your autonomous system, can be um, more trusted. So just in a, in a little more detail, this ROA is a signed object. It's an object which lists the prefixes which an, a particular uh, autonomous system number is authorized to announce, and it's signed by the resource holder with their RPKI certificate. It provides not only the prefix or prefixes and the origin AS that is authorized, but it gives a maximum length. So that's, that's a constraint on the number of the, the length of the prefix within your block which can be or which is also authorized um, to be announced by that autonomous system. So the the systems which are tied up with the whole RPKI framework then actually validate the in integrity of the route origin authorization of the ROA and, and they need to check whether the ROA was signed genuinely correctly by the holder of the prefixes using a valid RPKI certificate and if that's the case, then we can now use uh, that uh, routing announcement uh, which complies with this, uh, this ROA in the routing system. Part of that um, process is the RPKI validator. So the validator is a server which is gathering and validating ROAs from a set of RPKI databases. Now those, those databases are located with the RIRs, the NIRs, and with IANA as the uh, top-level IP address registry. Those databases are accessed via the um, what's called the the RPKI router um, Delta protocol. That validator accesses those databases. It assembles a cache of validated rowers, and it can then perform route origin validation based on that cache of rowers on behalf of routers which, uh, which query it. When a, a router queries that RPKI validation system, they will um, receive a result for a given route which says that that route within the RPKI, RPKI is either unknown or not found within the RPKI system, and that, that would be happening in the majority of cases now because as RPKI is rolled out, we only have a minority of address space actually covered by rowers. But, uh, so what it means is that that, that rower is not yet found in the RPKI system. Uh, there's really no difference uh, between 
uh, not found and not even using our PKI at all. So we can, we can ignore that as the default. The validator will also, can also return a valid status, which actually means that the ROA for your IP address uh, block exists. The uh, prefix, the origin, AS, and the length match those in the validated cache. cache. And so that will be a, a valid and validated route, which uh, under the RPKI framework can be more trusted than otherwise. You could also get an invalid um, routing state, which means that a ROA exists. This is address space or a route which is in theory certified, but there's some error. So this could be a, an attempt at, um, at squatting or um, spoofing, uh, faking a, a, a BGP announcement, or it could be a, simply an error, a, what we call a fat finger error, where someone has typed the wrong uh, IP address space into their, uh, into their router, and that's more common than you would think. So in that case, um, if, the, if the RPKI is, re is telling you that a route is invalid, then you would want to take some action on that. Now, at the, at the moment, um, you'd want to take action quite carefully on in invalid routes because the RPKI is a new system and uh, it's still being um, sort of bedded in, if you like. But if you were to get an invalid route, um, if, you're, if, you're getting, if you're seeing that for an inbound route from upstreams or peers, then you'd probably want to, well, you may want to drop that route, you may want to give it a lower local preference, or you may want to do nothing. In the case of outbound routes to customers, you'd want, you, you could, under the, the way the framework is evolving, you could tag those routes before redistributing them, them to your customers to allow your customers to make their own choices on those routes. Or you could, um, or as I said, you could tag them, for instance, at an IXP, so that, um, for instance, a community tag could be applied based on the validation status of, of not found valid and invalid. That, that also, again, allows your uh, customers or peers to make uh, choices about what to do with those, in, those invalid routes. So in the case of, um, of border routers, if you have an IS ISP with a number of border routers, then those border routers are simply um, talking directly to the, to the validator to determine whether um, routes they've heard uh, should be filtered or, or, pr or accepted or not. Um, and that, can, that is a point-to-point -point, um, communication between, the, between each of your border routers and a validator accessing the validated um, ROV cache. cache. One interesting application that's being rolled out uh, right now uh, quite effectively is that IXPs where across the, the IXP uh, switch it is uh, possible to um, implement route origin validation to simply ensure that the routes that are being shared by peers at the IXP are, um, are intact and valid. So in this case, and this is something that has been implemented in quite a few cases already, if an, an ISP wants to, wants to announce a, a route across the exchange, then that will go to the route server, and the route server can also talk to the validator to make sure that the, uh, the announcement that it's, it's heard can be validated, and then it will redistribute the routing announcement um, with tags or filters to improve the reliability of routing across the exchange. Okay, so that's the, the basic sort of um, function and application of, R, of RPKI. As I, as I said at the start, this is something that's a transition of the routing system into a new, uh, more uh, robust and validated uh, framework. It's actually being deployed pretty actively at the moment, so it's really worth keeping an eye on who is actually implementing RPKI and what they're requiring, for instance, of customers and peers. And what are your opportunities if you're involved with an ISP or if, if you're a network operator, what are your opportunities to uh, implement RPKI and to, to take advantage of it? So there's quite a lot of, um, of uh, data collection going on at the moment across the internet as well of, of how much deployment there is. And there's a, an RPKI monitor here at, uh, at nist.gov, which is a publicly accessible service. And it's, it's looking at the total, the RPKI status across the total routing system. Uh, looking, as it says here, at 811,955 uh, unique uh, routes and looking at the RPKI status of them. And the interesting thing is there's very close to 13%, this was last week, very close to 13% of all routes uh, which are uh, surveyed here have actually got valid RPKI rowers attached to them. 
So that's, that's um, really a pretty good record. I mean, we've got a long way to go, but 13% um, but, uh, effectively of that number of routes does indicate a high level of deployment uh, already. The number of invalid routes is quite small. It's 0.75%. Uh, now, as I said before, that could be in relation to either nefarious uh, malicious activity in, in trying to hijack routes or to pollute the routing system. It could be due to errors made by operators in, in incorrectly configuring routing or it could actually be in relation to misuse of the RPKI. So it might be, um, it's probably not, um, wouldn't be valid to assume that nearly 1% of all routes in the routing system are invalid, but that's how they're appearing at the moment. So if you were, if you were dealing with those routes, you'd want to take some notice of what, um, of falsely flagged. And we've got 86% um, or so of, of the routing system still not yet uh, certified or validated under RPKI, but that's something that is changing quite rapidly. If we look at the uh, regional status, we've got across the economies, and this is a sampling of the economies that APNIC serves, we've got some interesting um, progress being made. Uh, we've got anything up to, well, the, the chart shows, a um, little hard to read, but the first black bar under for each economy is the percentage of organisations that we deal with as APNIC members, for instance, that actually are using RPKI and have registered route, um, rowers. The blue bar is the percentage of IPv6 address space in that economy that is uh, under rowers, and the green is the, f the blue is uh, IPv4, the, the green is the percentage of IPv6 address space. So uh, perhaps the best, best example here is, um, well, the best examples are, in fact, uh, Sri Lanka, Singapore, and Taiwan. So Taiwan shows just over 20% of organizations in the RPKI uh, being actually participating in uh, the RPKI, having certificates and rowers. But that actually accounts for over 90% of IPv6 address space in Taiwan. It accounts for nearly 70% of IPv4 address space. And that's, um, those numbers are very good. On the other hand, Sri Lanka has uh, got 60% of its, of its community participating in the RPKI. That's a much smaller, smaller community, mind you, so it's, uh, it's probably a smaller number of, of actual individual operators. They've reached um, over 90% of IPv4, uh, but less than 60% of IPv6. And, and as you see, there are some economies listed here, uh, mainland China, Hong Kong, Indonesia, India, uh, Vietnam, for instance, that are, are yet to do very much at all. But I think you can see a, a quite a healthy uptake of RPKI across the Asia-Pacific region already, uh, according to these, uh, these figures. And that's good to see. So there you are, Taiwan. Another, another thing for the Taiwanese our, our internet community to be, to be proud of in this case. So that's, that's nice to see. So a few more details here about RPKI adoption, and there have been quite a few major announcements. So uh, NTT America is now recognizing rowers as of uh, July last year, so BGP customers can uh, uh, register their rowers and use those and have them available to NTT for validating those routes. Uh, NLNet Labs in the Netherlands is, uh, has created a public domain and open source RPKI validator, which is a, a small and, and portable um, implementation as of uh, mid last year. It's also producing analytics similar to the ones that I've shown here about RPKI adoption globally. Cloudflare, as we know, a, a very large content provider, has announced the use of route origin validation at its 150 points of interconnect as of September last year. So if you're wanting to interconnect with um, Cloudflare, then they are asking you to register your route origin authorizations in order to do that. Cloudflare has also been um, producing some very useful um, RPKI systems implementations, uh, what we call relying party software and server implementations. Uh, there, are, there are URLs given in these, um, in these uh, details here for anyone who wants more information. I don't expect you to sort of memorize those, but I'm sure the, uh, the presentation materials can be made available if you'd like to follow up. Moving right along, Amazon, uh, Amazon Web Services is now requiring the use of um, rowers 
by customers who are using the BYOIP service as of November last year. So if, if you're connecting to Amazon with your own IP addresses, then they are asking you or requiring you to have those addresses in the RPKI and to have ROAS uh, lodged for those in order to uh, interconnect with Amazon. So that's a very, a very strong statement of s support and requirement by Amazon, again, to ensure that their, uh, their routing system is not uh, receiving and propagating uh, incorrect routes. Uh, OpenBSD has um, announced uh, RPKO clients to be in uh, future distributions of, of their uh, software um, and their BGP daemon BGPD. Uh, again, NLNet Labs uh, has uh, software uh, which, this is important, um, this is uh, the Krill uh, RPKI server which is being developed. And th this is what allows you as a downstream uh, IP address recipient from, say, APNIC or TWNIC to run your own RPKI certification authority. So if you're a large ISP and you're distributing IP addresses in blocks to downstream uh, ISPs, then in fact you may wish to be serving as a certification authority for that address base and issuing those, those IP addresses. APNIC offers a service which allows you to do that, but, um, but this um, development from NLNet Labs will allow you to do it yourself if that's how you wish to, uh, to work. Uh, KPMN in the Netherlands uh, is also implemented and announced RPKI uh, for their customers and smaller peers. APNIC, along with other RIRs, has been very active, uh, thanks to uh, Jeff Houston, uh, George Michelson and others um, at, at APNIC. They've been uh, actively involved with the standardization service, uh, the standardization process. Uh, RFC 8369 has recently been approved. That refers to validation reconsidered, which is an adjustment to the, the validation algorithms of RPKI to, um, to uh, improve their effectiveness. There's something else called uh, the resource tagged attestation, which I mentioned has gone to the IETF as a draft. And that's that, uh, that ability, as I said, to be uh, uh, signing with your resources uh, an attestation, a, a statement such as a letter of authority. Uh, ZDNS in Beijing is um, maintaining the RPSTIR, a relying party software. Um, that includes uh, something called Slurm, which is support for the use of local trust anchors within the RP RPKI system. And that supports the, the APNIC proposed validation uh, reconsidered. So the, the point here is that um, there's a lot going on on, uh, on RPKI around the world, and it's something that, um, that can improve your routing. It's something that can be required of you in, uh, in interconnection as well. And finally, on, uh, on IXPs, there are quite a few IXPs that are implementing RPKI across the router, across the switch. Uh, to ensure that um, that routes exchanged over, over the over the IXP are, are more reliable, that goes back all the way to um, Japan in um, October 2014. They implemented a, a JPNAP at uh, MultiFeed. Uh, interestingly, Crix in Costa Rica uh, back in 2015. And I, I give uh, credit to our to APNIC's uh, peer registry, LACNIC, for having done a, a huge amount of work on promoting uh, RPKI in the Latin America region. Uh, also AM6, uh, also BK Nix, Lynx in uh, Manchester, uh, DE Kicks, and probably quite a few other IXPs are, um, are implementing uh, ROV. I'm sorry if, if it's being implemented by any of the Taiwan IXPs, I don't have that information, but I'd be, be very interested to know if that uh, is happening. Okay, so just to summarize, the whole point of RPKI is to improve the validation of your resource holdings that that used to be possible only by having records in in the whois database which really isn't good enough from a from a security point of view and certainly not for automation or for cryptographic security much much safer than um, than than who is and uh, it's also uh, something that can be automated as you've as, as you've seen in some of these systems that I've described here um, the idea is improving the security of the routing system to stop either route hijacks polluting the routing system, to stop errors from being propagated through the routing system and causing potentially very serious problems uh, globally across uh, internet routing. So um, this is a uh, route origin vali validation you might notice. This is about the, the validation of route origins. 
We're not talking yet about, or about an implementation of BGP path um, validation, but that's something that's under development for those who, who are um, uh, interested in that. Um, deployment is accelerating. Uh, global IPv4 coverage of around 13% and growing. Uh, there are software and vendor implementations, uh, and there are plenty of IXPs, uh, CDNs, and uh, Tier 1 networks who are now deploying or announcing. So if you're interested in participating, where do you start? Well, APNIC has got this uh, charming uh, campaign called Ready to Rower. So if you're ready to uh, create your rowers uh, for your IP address holdings held uh, at APNIC, uh, you can, as an APNIC member, you could use my APNIC, uh, TWNIC as well. Of course, we're working closely with TWNIC on implementation here. If you encourage your IXPs to implement ROV, then that will also help you as a, as a peer at the ISP to trust the routing announcements that are coming across from your uh, local peers. So that's in your interest and everyone else's as well. So encouraging your IXPs to, uh, to implement is a good thing. You can set up uh, route validation at your own uh, border routers and then encourage your peers and your customers to do, um, to do the same, to implement I RPKI. And as I said, APNIC and, uh, and both uh, APNIC and TWNIC are here to, to help with this process. So please uh, do be in touch if there's anything we can do to help. And that's all I have, so thank you very much. Very happy in the couple of minutes available if there are any questions. Okay, everything must be crystal clear. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Paul. And let's welcome the next speaker, David Conrad, CTO of ICANN, to de deliver his speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David Conrad, um, uh, ICANN CTO. Uh, I was asked to talk a bit about um, some of the uh, security-related issues. Um, so I, I put together a, uh, a set of slides talking about um, just sort of sampling the various threats um, that uh, I personally see related to uh, the global internet. Um, some of this is related to stuff ICANN does, some of it isn't. Um, I'll try to make that clear uh, as we go through the, uh, the slides. See if this works. Not that button. How about there? We go. Um, so the first threat uh, I wanted to uh, discuss is something that's um, currently uh, fairly active uh, right now, even as we speak, and that's something known as uh, domain name hijacking. Um, as you're all aware, people prefer using uh, names. The internet sort of relies on numbers. Um, so uh, DNS hijacking is uh, taking advantage uh, and compromising the translation mechanism between those two. Uh, the way this is done, uh, well, unfortunately, it's uh, typically done by the fact that people really, really are not good at using um, passwords. Um, they use simple passwords. They use uh, passwords um, across multiple sites. Um, they don't use multi-factor authentication, even when it's available. Um, there's also, uh, today, it's really uh, easy to get fooled by phishing attacks. Um, particularly given that um, in, the, in the past, we used to tell people, you know, look for a padlock uh, on your browser bar, uh, and that means your connection is safe. Um, actually, that's uh, not true anymore. Um, if it ever was true, it's definitely not true now. Um, you're able to get free certs from folks like um, Let's Encrypt by EFF, uh, low-cost certs from Komodo, um, and that will allow you uh, to get a little, uh, allow attacker to, to present a little uh, padlock bar um, in, your, uh, in your browser navigation uh, bar. Um, uh, and very few people actually click on the padlock to see if it makes sense, uh, the, the name actually matches what you thought you were going to. Um, so that's another way that uh, people have been compromised. Um, the, uh, uh, oh yeah, um, exploiting unpatched uh, vulnerabilities in software. 
uh, one of the ways the attackers right now uh, have been leveraging, um, uh, have been gaining access is by just using um, uh, unpatched um, exploits uh, in servers that are uh, providing infrastructure for the DNS. Uh, so in general, what's been happening is um, registrars' uh, accounts are being compromised. Uh, when the accounts are compromised, uh, then people are allowed to, are able, the, ba the attackers are able to insert uh, whatever domain name records they want uh, into um, the, uh, the uh, domain name, which means that it's trivial to implement um, uh, man-on-the-middle attacks or eavesdropping attacks or those sorts of things. And also DNSSEC can't help you here because these are actually the authoritative records. The system is uh, unable to tell the difference between uh, you as uh, the actual uh, authorized user of the account and someone who's stolen your credentials. Um, the other area that uh, is a bit concerning is some of the attackers are trying to take advantage of what's known as the trans transitive trust relationship of uh, the domain name system. Um, what this means is you have a set of name servers uh, for any domain. Um, if you're able to compromise any of those name servers, or the name servers for those name servers repeat until end, uh, then you're able to compromise the communications that goes through those name servers. Um, so uh, in the, those graphs uh, that are almost unreadable, um, the top one is a, the transitive, tra transitive trust graph of uh, .eu. Um, and it's relatively straightforward. There, I think, are on the order of uh, 16 nodes that represent the attack surface. So if the bad guys were able to compromise any one of those 16 nodes, which were represented by ovals, um, then they'd be able to uh, redirect the DNS. Um, the graph below, uh, which is largely unreadable, um, is uh, the uh, transitive trust graph for uh, Taiwan. Um, what that reflects is that Taiwan has a large number of name servers uh, and also relies on sex some external organizations to provide name service. So the transitive trust graph actually grows. Um, this uh, is a blown up image, still largely unreadable, but just give you sort of a, a, a flavor of the, the increased uh, attack service associated with relying on external uh, name servers. Um, if any one of those are compromised, it does allow for ultimately a compromise of names associated with .tw. And what that means is uh, any name at um, the second level in .tw, and then any names below that. Uh, because the way the DNS works, if you're able to compromise somewhere up on the higher part of the tree, then uh, folks down below the tree are also compromisable. Um, bad guys have been using this quite effectively uh, recently. Uh, some of you might have read about um, attacks. It was on Krebs Online and a bunch of uh, security-related um, uh, blogs. Um, these attacks have primarily, uh, most recently, been targeting uh, actors within the Middle East. It's believed that it's being originated by a state-based actor, but attribution is always extremely hard in these cases. Um, the uh, attacks have been focused on large-scale infrastructure. So, uh, for example, telephone companies, governments, uh, utilities, those sorts of things. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, these attacks have been quite successful, uh, and the attackers have been um, fairly effective in hiding the attacks. One of the things that they did is they would change name server records for only like an hour uh, four, t four or five times a day to try to minimize the, uh, the chances that they'd be noticed. Um, and as a result, uh, this uh, attack has been ongoing now for uh, since some uh, indications suggest since uh, 2017. Um, they were only recently sort of uh, detected, um, and uh, there has been some attempts at mitigation. Um, but given that length of time and the, the fact that uh, with redirection, uh, the hijacking of the DNS, it allows for um, folks to uh, man in the middle attack, uh, collect um, credentials, uh, do pretty much anything they'd like. Um, the chances that um, we've been able to identify all the, uh, the compromised sites is actually quite low. Um, cache poisoning, um, talked a bit about this yesterday. So uh, result, the way the internet scales uh, via the DNS is that the resolvers keep a copy of the information that they've queried for. 
Um, if bad guys are able to, they can insert um, uh, bogus records instead of the actual records into the cache. This was actually specifically, uh, DNSSEC, the DNS security enhancements, was specifically designed to address this. Um, the, this is a actual flaw in the original specification of the DNS protocol. Um, and uh, it's actually quite effective if you're able to see the queries uh, before they hit the authoritative server. If you, a bad guy, are able to see the queries before uh, it's, it, it goes to the authoritative server, you can respond more quickly uh, than the authoritative server with um, bogus information. Um, the mitigation for this particular attack is actually to enable DNSSEC. Um, DNSSEC has two parts. There's the signing side, so if you're a domain name owner yourself, uh, in most cases, uh, you're able to sign your zone. Uh, DNSSEC signing your zone um, is a somewhat complicated function, um, but there are now a lot of tools uh, that make it a lot easier, and increasingly some registries are uh, providing sort of put, uh, push button DNSSEC enablement, uh, for example. Uh, I personally use Cloudflare for one of my domains, and turning on DNSSEC is simply uh, flipping a switch. The other side of DNSSEC is the validation side, and internet service providers need to enable this. Uh, right now, uh, we're seeing about 20% of uh, responses being validated. Um, one of the efforts that we're undertaking at ICANN is try to increase that number. Route system hijacking. This is uh, a lot what um, uh, involves what Paul was talking about. Um, so this attack is uh, to um, have a fake announcement uh, be listened to by ISPs around the world. Um, it's relatively common, happens uh, with some frequency, mostly due to uh, typos. Uh, there have been some occasions where uh, it was uh, seen as part of a malicious attack. Uh, some of you might have heard of uh, myetherwallet.com. Um, that was an attack that uh, utilized both um, route hijacking as well as cache poisoning. So it sort of collects the whole set of, of attacks. Um, uh, mitigations for this, well, one thing would be that um, the ISPs could be more aggressive in filtering out uh, the routing announcements uh, by looking at existing routing registries. Um, this is very labor intensive uh, and hasn't really been very popular. Uh, RPKI that Paul discussed before does provide a new way of doing this. Um, RPKI is, um, in my personal view, very complicated, um, uh, but it does have uh, quite a bit of promise in addressing at least some of the, the more common failures with regards to uh, route hijacking, in particular the typos that occur. Um, there are ways of getting around it uh, that um, people are, are uh, trying to explore solutions to, um, but uh, I would encourage all ISPs to start looking at deploying RPKI within their routing announcements. Denial of service. Um, this one has uh, been really popular uh, and uh, only seems to be increasing uh, with uh, deployment of IoT devices and um, uh, additional uh, um, mechanisms on the internet that allows for the creation of vast amounts of traffic to flow from one corner to the next. Um, it's very simple. You just sort of overwhelm the target. Um, and there are a variety of ways you can do that. Uh, one of the ways actually uses the DNS. Uh, the DNS has the uh, interesting attribute that you don't um, have to establish a connection. You just send a datagram out. Uh, and you get a response back as a datagram. If you're able to spoof the source address, that is, make up the source address, um, you can uh, target uh, somebody by simply changing the source address to be them, send the packet out, uh, and the response will go back uh, to your target. Uh, if you're using the DNS, you can also amplify that by uh, sending out a query. Uh, generally, queries are about 90 bytes. Um, there are uh, particular queries that can result in very large responses on the order of uh, 2K response. So a single 90-byte packet results in a 2K response. You can target that off uh, to a, uh, a victim, and very quickly, given there are hundreds of thousands, yeah. at least, of open resolvers out there, you can flood the, these sorts of attacks um, quite easily uh, across the world. 
DNS is not the only protocol you can do this. Uh, NTP is also one that's used quite frequently. Uh, memcache uh, protocol uh, is one that allowed for a multiple an amplification factor on the order of tens uh, of thousands of bytes. Um, so uh, the nice thing about denial of service is that it's so easy to implement. There are services, or there used to be uh, quite a few services where you could actually buy it online. It was uh, called booter services or stressor services. Um, uh, some law enforcement has have been cutting down on those um, uh, by cl uh, actually closing up those shops, um, but it's still uh, quite common these days, and the attacks uh, continue to get larger. Um, this graph was done in March of 2018 and showed a peak of uh, 1.7 terabits per second. Uh, I've heard uh, the current uh, record is now at 2.4 terabits per second, which is a, uh, a large amount of traffic that it's difficult to imagine being able to keep up with. Um, over time, uh, this is likely to increase, and the, the sort of the slope of that graph is worrisome. Um, how do you mitigate those? Well, um, you increase capacity and diversity, but um, that's sort of a short-term solution. Uh, because it's always easier to find attack capacity than it is to pay for uh, defensive capacity. Um, filter source addresses, ISPs, if they would uh, do implement something called Best Common Practice uh, 38, BCP 38, uh, it would help to reduce uh, spoofing, it would help to reduce reflection attacks. Um, uh, there are costs to deploying BCP 38. Um, so a lot of ISPs have not done so, but it's something that uh, ISPs should uh, consider doing. Um, a lot of servers, uh, uh, services that are available on the internet have um, uh, bottlenecks. If you're able to eliminate them, then you reduce the opportunity for denial of service attacks. Um, and uh, one of the key things is to try to fix vulnerabilities in software that allow people to create these botnet armies uh, of uh, compromised computer systems that can be used to uh, attack um, uh, victims across the internet. Um, phishing and spear phishing. Um, so this is probably familiar to most of the people here. Um, it, you create some sort of lure, something that looks like email that you would expect. Uh, I'll encourage people to click on some URL. Uh, that uh, URL then takes you to a machine that uh, causes malware to be installed on your computer or presents you with a form that allows you to type in a user ID password, giving the bad guys access to your accounts. Um, that URL at the top um, might look like something that, if you happen to use Gmail, uh, might be look like something you might encounter. Uh, you may not have noticed that there is a tiny little dot under the M. That's actually a IDN um, in .com. Uh, that domain was, until uh, about three days ago, um, held by a researcher who had put up a page that said, um, be very careful, this could be used for phishing. It appears that that researcher uh, unfortunately let his registration expire, and it was just recently snapped up, uh, apparently, um, by uh, someone who has a web page, um, uh, a, uh, a default web page uh, in Chinese, saying, "Congratulations, you set up your web page correctly." Um, and uh, right now, don't know where that's going to go to. Um, uh, it. It's hard to imagine a scenario in which that domain name would actually be useful for anything other than phishing, um, but it uh, does exist and is currently in play. Um, the uh, mitigation of this, um, deploy. there are a bunch of technologies out that are helping to try to reduce the flood of spam, the flood of in, uh, invalid email. Uh, they're known as SPF, DCAM, DMARC. Uh, ISPs need to deploy those uh, on mail servers. Um, aggressively filter and quarantine spam. There's a lot of tools out there that, that will allow you to do that, some better, some worse. Uh, but be aggressive. Um, it's better to um, maybe dump some, something into a quarantine so that you can look at it much more carefully than to accidentally click on something that um, will result in your machine getting compromised. Um, and end user education and training. 
Um, this is all part of cyber hygiene. It's uh, doing things to try to, to protect yourself on the Internet these days. Um, uh, at ICANN, we actually have a program where our IT department uh, purposefully tries to send us phishing email, trying to fake us into clicking on links. And if you do, you get a friendly message saying you shouldn't have done that, uh, and you get to have more uh, anti-phishing training. Um, this has actually been quite effective because the anti-phishing training is really quite boring. Um, so uh, I'd encourage people to look into doing that, encourage their companies to do that. Um, botnets. Uh, botnets are basically just a whole bunch of compromised machines controlled by a, uh, a bad guy through a command, uh, command channel, usually synchronized via the DNS. Um, uh, domain generation algorithms are used to create these domains uh, that the uh, malware will go and do queries to. If they get a, a response back, then they can establish a command and control uh, connection to uh, the botnet herder. Uh, the botnet herder then can, you know, control hundreds of thousands or millions of machines and point them at uh, whatever target they'd like to, to do whatever they'd like to do. For example, denial of service attacks, run spam, uh, you know, send out a whole bunch of spam, um, allow people to, to bounce through the compromised machines uh, to hide their tracks in case they're trying to hide their activities. Um, Botnets are uh, usually created through um, phishing, spear phishing, spam, cl people clicking on things that they shouldn't, installing software they shouldn't. Um, it is, uh, right now, we're seeing um, within the uh, domain abuse activity reporting system, we're seeing about uh, two to three percent of domain names that are somehow associated with uh, botnet command and control. So there are a lot of uh, machines out there controlling a whole bunch of uh, uh, what are known as zombies or bots. Uh, same sort of mitigations you get with uh, uh, phishing. Um, you know, make sure you don't click on things you're not supposed to click on. Privacy violation and data breaches. Um, so uh, as I'm sure all of you are aware, um, there are companies out there that have uh, business models that are focused on collecting uh, private information that they then use uh, to sell targeted ads and those sorts of things. Uh, there are also folks who maintain very large databases of uh, private information that get breached with really unfortunate uh, frequency. Um, that uh, top graphic, uh, Have I Been Pwned, is actually a really interesting website. Uh, it's, you can sign up to it, put in your email address, and it'll tell you whether your email address has been found within any of the data breaches that uh, this, the researcher actually collects, a guy named Troy Hunt. Um, I've done that, uh, and in fact, all of my email addresses that I uh, use publicly have at one time or another been found on compromised databases that uh, have been sold on the dark web. Um, it's uh, haveibeenpwned.com. I actually recommend its use. Um, the uh, data breaches are increasing in frequency and scale. Uh, there are, uh, within the Have I Been Pwned uh, database itself, I believe there are um, uh, over 7 billion email accounts, uh, which is pretty impressive given there are yeah, 4 billion people on the internet today. Um, mitigations with these, um, it, basically end user uh, education always helps, you know, explain to people that, you know, if uh, you are not paying for the service, you probably are the service. Uh, the information that you provide uh, for organizations that are providing you services free of charge are how they make money uh, when they turn around and sell that information to for targeting ads and those sorts of things. If you're aware of that and okay with that, then that's fine. Uh, if you're not aware, uh, then that's something you might want to make yourself aware of. Um, increased use of uh, end-user encryp encryption and authentication. Um, it's useful to actually try to limit the amount of information that's propagated over the Internet um, uh, in plain text uh, because there are people out there who are watching for plain text and collecting it. Um, and finally, um, implementation and enforcement of data privacy laws. The uh, data privacy law of interest these days is GDPR, but it is by far not unique. Uh, many countries are implementing similar data privacy regula regulations. In fact, some U.S. states are even implementing data privacy regulations. 
um, which annoys uh, some of the companies in those states. Um, misinformation, also known as fake news. Um, this has become increasingly uh, obvious to people. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of misinformation on the internet, the uh, application of uh, age-old techniques of propaganda, the um, exploitation of confirmation bias, all of those things allow for information to propagate that actually has no basis in reality. Um, the implication of that is that um, it re reduces trust in the traditional uh, information sources, and it also tends to result in governments, uh, you know, politicians want to, want to do things, uh, coming up with ways of trying to uh, uh, control or limit the propagation of that information. And unfortunately, sometimes the, uh, the good gets thrown out with the bad, uh, misinformation and good information get blocked equally. Um, mitigation to this, you know, as always, uh, more uh, end user training, uh, you know, get uh, people to understand how to identify false news sources. There are a number of telltales uh, that unfortunately it's actually gotten a little harder uh, because GDPR makes it difficult to look up information in the who is um, to try to figure out if, uh, you know, someone is uh, not really associated with the New York Times. Um, uh, but um, trying to identify the sources of information and, and at least find corroborating information independent of the original source can help in trying to reduce uh, misinformation. Fragmentation of the Internet. Um, this is something that is, uh, you know, sometimes as a result of misinformation uh, flows. Um, people are beginning, uh, governments in particular, are, are beginning to uh, try to create their own islands of the internet. Um, the, uh, yeah, this is a, a, a understandable reaction to the challenges that seen if you uh, try to uh, have more control of the information that flows in and out of your country. Um, the downside is that um, it can result in blockage of useful information that people rely on. Uh, a, a study by Brookings Institute in 2016 showed that um, a blocking of the Internet resulted in a net loss of about $4.2 billion in GDP. Um, mitigation of this, um, so ideally we could go back to uh, something that may, ne may never have actually existed, the end-to-end -end model of the Internet. Uh, trying to minimize the amount of uh, devices in between the end-to-end -end connection. Um, uh, virtual private networks uh, are a way of getting around blockage in many cases, although uh, you then get into a cat and mouse game where folks are trying to block uh, the VPNs, uh, which results in new VPNs, and it just sort of goes uh, endless cycle that way. Um, but also trying to explain to particularly politicians, people who are trying to generate laws, um, uh, the implications of uh, the fragmentation and the partitioning that results from uh, se setting up you know, national level firewalls, uh, national level filtering schemes. Oops. There we go. Summarizing. Um, so a lot of these threats are leverag leveraging some of the fundamental aspects of the DNS, so uh, of the Internet. So things like the naming system, the routing system, um, and the ability to send lots of data at low cost. Um, the individual network operators uh, uh, and end users ha do have some mechanisms to try to address some of these, uh, these risks, these threats. Uh, they include, uh, most importantly, improving cyber hygiene, uh, just trying to make sure that you have good passwords, you don't reuse the passwords, you use multi-factor authentication, uh, deploy DNSSEC, make sure it's turned on, those sorts of things. Um, uh, but ultimately, um, the preventing these, uh, these attacks are becoming increasingly complicated. The, uh, the bad guys uh, are, uh, in my view, uh, in the lead. They can move much more uh, quickly than the good guys, uh, you know, trying to get um, law enforcement to work uh, cross-jurisdictionally uh, despite uh, interests on both sides often takes quite a bit of time, whereas the bad guys can move uh, in the minutes time frames. Um, ultimately, uh, the risks of uh, the uh, an unanticipated consequences um, collateral damage, as we've seen with uh, GDPR and the impact on who is, um, is significant, um, but end user education is hopefully one way that we can address uh, some of these concerns. 
And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions in the minus two minutes we have left. Good, I've scared everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so please stay on the stage. Let's have a group shot here. And also, Mr. Paul Wilson, please come to the stage. And uh, now, uh, while we are t having the stage, the next session will be <coughs> uh, concerning about security. And we will begin very soon. So after the group shot here, we will uh, manage, we'll ask all the speakers to come on the stage. This section will be collaborative security, responsibility, confidence, and consensus. The moderator is the deputy CEO of TWNIC, Joey Chen. The speakers are David Conrad, the CTO of ICANN, Bob Hong, uh, the general manager of Taiwan Business Units of Trend Micro, Geoff Houston, the chief scientist of APNIC, and Yukako Uchida leader of Gold Board Coordination Division of the JP Cert CC. Let's give them a plot. Welcome then. <laughs> well, everybody want to talk about security, I guess. OK, so uh, yeah, uh, my, my honorable uh, panelist, please have a seat. So um, yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Joy Chen, and I work for TW Nick, also for the TW Search slash CC, which is the coordinator center. And it's my honor to have my panelists here on the stage. We're going to be talking about security. And uh, it's not just any security, it's the collaborative security. So I think it's going to be a very interesting session. And uh, um, as you all have heard the keynote from David, he has shared a lot of the different um, threats, the different methods of the threats. And the bad guys are really uh, very intelligent as well. So I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion today. And uh, before I introduce everyone on the stage, I also want to share with you that the way that we're going to run this uh, forum for this session is that every one of my panelists will share a little bit about their views on the collaborative security. And uh, we welcome all the comments and uh, questions. So with the two open mics on the floor, I will encourage you to come to the mic and uh, share with us why we are doing our presentation or discussions. And I will wait for the proper pause for you to share your comments and the questions. OK. So um, first, you have already know David. David just gave this wonderful keynote. And uh, he's coming from ICANN with the CTO. So with all the technology aspects and uh, all the experiences, I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful thing. And Bob, as you many of you from locally will know that he's coming from Trend Micro. That's a, that's a brand name here from Taiwan. And uh, we'd be very happy to share his uh, thoughts locally. And, uh, um, and, and of course, Jeff. Jeff is the, the chief, scientist, chief scientist from APNIC. And from his experience and also some of the comments that I have heard from him yesterday, I know that he's got a lot to uh, share with the audience, it's depending on how much that we can ask and dig out from him, right, Jeff? And uh, obviously, from our community, from the security community, from uh, JP Search, we have Yoka here. So, um, without um, further um, delay, I like to um, have each one of our panelists to start doing some sharing. But I'm going to give David maybe a little break since you just did the the uh, the wonderful keynote. Do you mind? No. Okay. Okay, so why don't we uh, just uh, go by with um, Bob. Maybe do you want to share some of your thoughts with um, the, the, the team on the collaborative security? Okay, do we have the... Yeah. Uh, can I use my slide? <laughs> okay. Sorry. I think I, I prefer stand here to, to do my presentation. Okay. Um, okay. Um, first of all, I'm uh, I'm glad to be here to share my thoughts and uh, also learn from our 
experts uh, from different specs uh, for this very important topic is the curvature security. Okay, uh, I, I would like to have brief introduced about uh, Termicro. We, uh, uh, Termicro was founded in 1988, so uh, in past 30 years, we focus on cybersecurity industry. And, uh, and uh, we start from uh, antivirus, and uh, in the past 10 years, uh, we dedicate in uh, uh, data center and the cross security and also uh, the main street events. Um, in uh, 2012, uh, Taiwan uh, team found an uh, uh, incident response team. Uh, in, uh, in, the, in the past six years, we uh, have been conduct uh, more than 500 uh, incident investigation for more than 200 customers. So what I'm going to share is based on my observation uh, for, my, for the cyber incident uh, handling experience. Okay, so, uh, well, this screen, next, okay, good. Also, uh, we, we understand threat intelligence is, is so critical uh, for threat defense. Okay, um, well, it may include these three parts, but not limited in these three parts. Also, it, it's about to what the hackers' tactics and uh, what's the technology uh, hack used, and also the vulnerability. Uh, we all know the critical vulnerability uh, could uh, create huge damage. Uh, take example of uh, the WannaCry recent number in uh, 2017. Uh, well, it, it's, it's, you know, it's leveraging the vulnerability internal proof. That is very, very famous one. And, uh, but I, I personally, I think the vulnerability sharing uh, is Mm, it's also al already reached a certain level of maturity because uh, there's the organization like uh, ZDI, Zero Day uh, Initiative and the adopt, adopt the uh, bounty program to encourage researchers to report the vulnerability. And also, very important is the technology they used, uh, just, just as Debbie just shared, a lot of uh, new um, technology like uh, um, ballast, like uh, uh, new malware, new CNC, that kind of things. And also, uh, equally important, I think, is uh, takers' uh, 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 tactics. Um, it means uh, wha how taker, uh, how hacker penetrate uh, the organization. Uh, what kind of uh, point of entry? How they do uh, the little movement? What kind of system they want to leverage to dispute the malware? And also, what kind of tool they do the control? Like uh, they normally will use the, the normal tools the IT will use, like. Uh, uh, power share, like a remote desktop, uh, uh, that, that, kind, that kind of things, uh, and uh, how they do it. So I, I think this is very important uh, for, uh, for not just for threat defense, but also for the threat investigation. Um, uh, our IR team, incident response team, we always find, found the same tactic, the same technology, same methods uh, used in different victims again and again and again. Okay. So uh, because of that, so I think. Um, uh, the government uh, more or less will uh, take initiatives about uh, how to share the threat intelligence. Uh, uh, take Taiwan as an example, um, you know, uh, Department of uh, Cybersecurity uh, is, uh, was founded in uh, 2016. And also in uh, uh, 2017, uh, the, the department already launched um, a, a cybersecurity infrastructure enhancement project. Okay, so in this project, um, uh, the government defined uh, the five domain of critical infrastructure, including the like a government agency, the fin uh, banking finance, telecom, uh, etc. A lot of uh, critical infrastructure, and also each uh, domain have a so-called ISAC information sharing analysis center. So all the critical infrastructure owner they should uh, report the cyber incident to the domain ISAC, and domain ISAC will after collection the information and the analysis, they will share to other inv uh, infrastructure owners. And also all the information will report to the national ISAC and also report to uh, like uh, TDNIC because of uh, TDNIC plays the uh, third DC role. Okay, so, uh, and also uh, in the near future, uh, the government will have, uh, you know, uh, so-called domain third and domain SOC and the national third and national SOC. So, I just screen capture from you know our government document. Okay, so all the uh, uh, design I think is, uh, is very comprehensive, and uh, the vision is also great. However, in the real practice, the real challenge is the why why the the critical infrastructure owner want to share the information. Okay, so uh, I just list a few challenge based on my uh, observation. First of all, is the there's no lack of uh, motivation and uh, mutual profit. So um, 
currently till now, I think the, the regulation enforcement is still the key driver, key driver for the you know, victim to report the incident. Uh, and also, uh, at the end, the, pilot, uh, the punishment is more than help for the victim to report a cyber incident. Why? And the, uh, the punishment is not about uh, you know, the government authority, the penalty. It's uh, about, for example, the information is crucial will make the damage of the company or organization reputation. For if, if, the, if this is a private company, that it means the, the, the you will lose customer uh, trust and also you may impact your stock price, which is the biggest worry for the CEO. Right? And, and also the second thing is, so at the end, as a result, as a result is the, mm, to comply the compliance, so they will try to repo but they will try to report as less as possible, okay, to, to prevent the further damage. And, and also the cyber threat is more customized than ever. Uh, based on our uh, uh, research, then uh, currently 90% of malware just affects one machine, which means hacker is targeting the certain target. So the malware is designed, is also uh, uh, modified and customized, just attack the single target. And 60% uh, of malicious domain just alive less than one hour because hackers don't want to be tracked. So that, that, that's the reality. So it means uh, when we share the malware sample, when we share the CNC, actually the value is decreasing. It's not like use, not like before. In, 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 in you know, virus outbreak age, then uh, what just one sample we can save, secure millions of customers, however now, just skill one customers, okay. And also, if we want to understand how the attacking campaign, campaign, which means that we need to know the tactics, the technology, the killer chain, the root cause, and as, which means it takes longer time, and also it requires very expert, you know, cybersecurity expert to doing so. However, uh, the, the reality is the, it is serious leakage of the, you know, the cybersecurity expert skill set, okay. So um, here's a little bit suggestion. Um, uh, I, I, I think there's some area we can improve. Uh, first of all is the, we need to build up the ability and capa capacity uh, for the instant response, instant navigation, even threat research for uh, like a national cert, like a domain cert. Uh, because if you want uh, to let a victim to willing to report the instant, which means that women need to provide some help which means when the report comes, then uh, we, we should have some, uh, like uh, instant mi mi mitigation services to them. Then they, uh, this is a mutual benefit, then they start willing to report incident. And, and also for the commercial sector, uh, still need to build up the in-house, like CSIRT, the instant response team, or you need to outsource to uh, you know, uh, the vendors, you know, they have a capability to do so. And also, uh, if we have a mechanism uh, to share the threat intelligence, but uh, without the victim inf information disclosure, that will be much more easy for, for every victim to willing to share the cyber incident. Okay, uh, then finally, we, we should facilitate the, uh, the atmosphere of uh, cooperation. Uh, uh, that, that, how to do that? First of all, I think uh, we need to have uh, you know, educate the right concept, the attitude to the authority and also the public. You know, in, at this time, still a lot of people, they think the company get compromise is unforgivable. <laughs> However, if the, the modern defense concept is uh, prevention is not possible, but uh, how to have early detection and uh, very quick response is the right way to do. So if this concept is not, is not uh, well educated to the people, then every time when we, saw, uh, we, we see news about uh, which company get compromised, we will fingerprint, uh, finger point to, to the company and uh, no, nobody wants to admit that, that that kind of thing happened. So it required educate, educate, educate again and again. Okay, this is my first year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. I think, um, yeah, this is great talk, a lot of the good reminders and uh, can we move on to Jeff? Sure, thank you. Um, it's on, is it? Thank you. Um, thank you and good morning all. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Jeff Houston. I am the Chief Scientist at APNIC and my job is thinking. 
Um, <laughs> so I certainly have some thoughts about this whole issue around, almost did it, around security. Even the simplest of things, and a steam engine is not intrinsically that difficult. There are very few components, but they used to fail in amazing ways. So even the simplest of things can have catastrophic failure. When we go to more, gee, more complex engines, <laughs> like this remote control, <laughs> the failures are far more epic. Now, I was tempted to put in a picture of a 737 MAX because the software failure there is a typical example that as we create more and more complex machinery in our world, the ability of that machinery to operate in ways that we never thought about and create epic failures is always there. If we think security is a fight, we will never win it. It is unwinnable. What we want from our network and our computers is complexity, is to guess my thought, is to be helpful, is to be incredibly complex. The result of that complexity is an ever larger risk of failure. So failure is now not slight. Failure is catastrophic. If I can hack into the local traffic signs in this city, I can cause this city to stop. If I can hack into the water system, watch out, or your electricity system. All of these systems are online. All of these systems are vulnerable. All of them, at their heart, have some version of Linux running. All of them use the same libraries. So our societies that use more and more and more of these systems, the WannaCry virus infected the UK NHS system and caused their scanners to go down. All these subtle effects are always with us. If we undermine security and integrity, we have really big problems today, problems that were never there a generation ago. So this is not an abstract conversation. This is a conversation about our society today. And it is bizarre. The biggest attack we saw, might still be the biggest, it's certainly a massive one, was caused by baby camera web monitors. <laughs> Unbelievable. But nevertheless true that it brought down the DNS infrastructure of the entire east coast of the US by harnessing a few million of these web cameras and sending DNS queries into a melt spot. The DNS melted, the internet melted, life was bad for a few hours. Baby web camera monitors. What did you buy? Well, you bought a camera. What was inside it? A full-blown TCP IP stack. What was inside that? An admin password that was actually published. What happened? Someone released a virus that harnessed all these cameras and just sent them to fetch URLs. Nothing was difficult. Attackers don't necessarily have PhDs. Attackers do the minimum possible work to cause the maximum possible damage. And what we do is field cheap, shoddy equipment that is readily subverted with almost no effort. This was a really easy hack for one of the most major events in the last few years. What are we doing about it? Good question. Certainly at APNIC, we can't ignore this, and we will not ignore it. In the address world, we understand we're part of a broader area of providing infrastructure services. IP addresses are part of the names and addressing system, and they're the bedrock of the internet. If we get this wrong, we have problems. All of us have problems. So we have a number of themes in which we're working in this, and you can see it on the slide there, that we do look very closely at DNSSEC. As you saw from Paul's presentation, we have invested years, in fact, it's getting close to decades of effort, in looking at how to help secure the routing system. It's an intrinsic part of what we do. Um, we're certainly very, very active in security cooperation and skills and knowledge, particularly with law enforcement. So we have a number of these. What we also do is figure out 
what our stakeholders want, what our community of members and, and other stakeholders actually want from us. What can we do to help? We survey them every two years. And although it's a busy slide, and I apologise, some years ago, V6, 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 V6. Today, V6 is still there, as well as the scarcity of V4 addresses and trading. But what's at the top? Network security. And in every single part, East Asia, Oceania, Southeast Asia, with the lesser developed countries and developing, all of them rank security as the greatest issue, the main challenge facing their organisation, which is, I think, part of the reason why you're here today and we're here today. We take it seriously. So what aspects of that are the main challenges? We are all worried about phishing, spam, and malware and ransomware. The insidious way they work, the way they dupe users who actually shouldn't know better. The attacks are sophisticated in that sense, is our number one concern. The DDoS attacks are also of concern. Intrusion, other breaches, staff lack of awareness and not attending enough phishing courses, David, um, <laughs> is certainly up there. <laughs> Oddly enough, routing security is not a major issue. And part of the reason is actually that the web PKI protects a lot of sites from the worst side effects of a routing attack. And the other little graph there, how might AP NIC assist? Well, we get the message. What you want from us is training. What you want from us is assistance with collaboration. What you want from us is to publish articles on our blog and disseminate security-related topics and content. We hear you. We are doing that. So what do we do? We certainly share and collaborate. We work at our members' meetings and all the other NOG forums to talk about security. We work with the national internet registries to ensure that our own asset, the address database, where addresses are, is as accurate as possible all the time. We're trying to make those query mechanisms be aligned so that when you look it up, the information is always right. And we're now working with the community to make sure that the point of contact information is actually up to date and valid. If you think there is an owner of an address that needs to know that their address is being hijacked. We're trying to make sure that the point of contact information is now valid. We're also working with the various certs and the C certs to strengthen collaboration and to coordinate that security community, including the law enforcement community, to actually work all on the same page. I want to talk a little bit more about one thing, though, which is different from Trend Micro. Because with Trend, you're looking at attacks on machines. The machine is being co-opted to do something that wasn't intended. Infrastructure security is actually entirely different. The machine's just fine. It's doing exactly what you intended it to do. But if I can make the name, the DNS, send you to somewhere bad, or the address infrastructure send you to somewhere bad, I don't have to attack your machine because I've changed the underlying fabric of the internet to suit my evil deeds to suit my evil purpose. Infrastructure attacks are the most insidious. They're the hardest to detect, and they are the most wide-ranging. If I was a malign and malicious person, I must admit I would look at addressing and routing as the point to attack. Everything else is kind of minor. If I really wanted to cause mayhem, that's where I would go. So how would I improve it? How are we improving it? We have very few tools available to us, remarkably few. If I've never met you and you're on the internet and I'm on the internet, how can you trust me? We can't meet, we can't exchange name cards, we can't talk, we can't establish each other's identity. Why should you trust me? What we've resorted to is keying infrastructure and cryptography. So I've never met you and you've never met me, but we might both know Paul. If Paul and I can say we trust each other and you and Paul can say we trust each other, then maybe we can use Paul as a referral mechanism to say, well, maybe we can trust each other. So we use that mechanism of transitive trust inside RPKI to do routing security and actually inside DNSSEC to do DNS security. Cryptography is essential. In APNIC, we've now spent 15 years working at this about testable attestations. Paul has gone through this in detail, so I won't spend much time at it.
but certainly this is a very serious area for us and we have devoted a lot of time and effort at it. We also strongly support the NAMES community in looking at DNSSEC and DNSSEC validation. We do long-range me um, measurements, we do a lot of analysis and a lot of work inside understanding how the DNS works to actually ensure that we can make the DNS as secure as we possibly can. But if this is a fight, we're never going to win it and we might well be losing it because the defender is at a disadvantage. We have to defend everything all of the time and this is not something that's easy. And indeed the whole threat landscape is actually not as simple as you think. We used to always see this as a good guys, bad guys. The bad guys are bad and the good guys are the certs and the C certs and the trend micros who work to try and catch the bad guys. But that's not true. There's actually a, th a third party, the security consultants. When your organisation is hacked, who do you call? Well, you might call a private consultancy firm. They're an interesting bunch of people. They pay more than the public enterprises, so they actually have the best people working for them. And they're not interested in catching the criminal. They're not even interested in fixing the problem. When a customer, a victim, pays the money, their major motivation is to deflect future attacks, to make sure that that victim is never a victim again. Oddly enough, that third party is one of the major parties in our fight against malware and our fight against all these kinds of badness on the internet. But oddly enough, their motives aren't to make it better. Their motives are simply to protect their clients. And so this three-way fight between the good guys and the public, sorry, the, between the public good guys and the private good guys and the bad guys is causing us all a fair deal of angst and confusion. How can we work together is actually not public and public, but a conversation about public and private to actually make sure that threat information is not a private asset, but a public good to make sure that the tools available to everyone actually allow us this more effective in fighting this problem. Thank you. Wonderful, isn't it? So now you have heard the uh, words of wisdom from the chief scientist. Right? I don't know how many of you will go home tonight and uh, take down your baby camera monitors. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, I think there is a good balance between the threat and uh, security and the protection. So, um, and also I appreciate when Jeff mentioned all this and uh, coming down to the end, it's really the infrastructure, the protection. So uh, ICANN and the APNIC and the so does TWNIC has put in a lot of the efforts talking about the DNSSEC, the, um, the RPKIs. So uh, Paul's talk talking about RPKI, I hope everybody gets a, a better view of, on it. So I'll pass ma the microphone to our next uh, panelist, to Yoka. Yoka is from JP Search. That's also serving as a security community, and uh, she's doing a lot of the outreach and the coordination work. So let's give a good hand to Yoka. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yukako Uchida. I work for uh, the JP CERT Coordination Center, um, the National CERT uh, of Japan. And, um, well, Bob mentioned about the collaboration between the, um, a lot of organizations um, involved in CERTs and, uh, you know, collaboration mechanism um, between those organizations. And I would like to talk about, um, well, just an example of our, our behalf. Um, what we're doing as JP CERT, and maybe explain a little bit about the role of CERTs that we're doing at JP CERT. So, um, just just a little introduction about what a CERT is doing is that um, when so when there is a cybersecurity incident uh, reported from the victim themselves or any other parties like security vendors um, or any anyone who detected the cybersecurity incidents, um, they can report to CERT like us. And then we will verify the incidents, and then we will um, coordinate in order to solve that situation. So um, we will be talking to, for example, to ISP or to um, system administrators. And then this is also important because, um, well, when it comes to incident that requires coordination uh, between, uh, you know, wi with other countries, uh, for example, incident that is, hap that is happening um, outside of J Japan's network, um, we will be, uh, we will be, we will have to contact the CERT. 
um, in that country so that we will request for help um, in, that, uh, in that country in question. So uh, this is where the um, international um, collaboration is uh, required. And my main role at JP CERT is to um, establish a uh, relationship between uh, national CERTs in other countries um, um, so that we can uh, collaborate smoothly in case of uh, cybersecurity incidents. And we're, uh, I mean, at JP CERT, we're making a lot of, a lot of efforts uh, in, um, uh, in doing so, like uh, creating a collaborative um, relationship with the local, uh, both local and also international um, communities. So I'd like to introduce some of the efforts that we're making um, in this regard. So um, this just map shows that the, what kind of um, organizations that we work with. Like uh, we, we work with the um, CSER communities and also a lot of um, vendors and ISPs and the industrial entities, et, et cetera, in order to solve incidents um, that, that are reported to, to us. And uh, I'd like to mention some of the national, uh, I mean, local uh, efforts that we're making. So um, Bob mentioned about the ISACs um, that is um, existing in, in, in Taiwanese community. In Japan also, we have uh, several ISACs uh, in place. Uh, for example, the biggest one is the financial sector, and also there's uh, others in electricity and IC, IC, ICT sector as well. And there are others um, also um, on the way um, creating uh, ISACs. And uh, one thing I'd like to introduce um, is uh, in Japan, we have the Nippon Sea Cert Association. This is the local community for uh, certs. Um, for example, uh, the search that is operating um, under the um, e enterprises or, for example, universities and those um, entities. Um, it, it is really common in Japan to create a C cert within the uh, commercial entities and in, in those, um, um, you know, any companies. And then we have a growing number of members in there. Uh, JP Cert uh, playing a role in the uh, NCA uh, community as well, uh, being uh, one of the steering committee members for a long while and the lead in the discussion. Um, this community actually creates a venue for a uh, search in the local community to actually collaborate with each other. So uh, they have a set of um, different uh, working group activities. They have, for example, exercises that they conduct, or they have like, conferences so they can you know, um, present uh, what they're doing, or uh, for example, case studies about um, incident that they have handled recently, et cetera. So this creates a venue really for like, um, exchanging information or maybe like asking for help uh, when it comes to uh, incidents that re require um, help from others. That's, that's one thing that they're doing in Japan. And I would also like to mention about the global outreach that we we're making. So this is the number of this, the CCTLDs that we have um, coordinated with um, during the past um, seven, nine, uh, seven, eight years. Um, so um, this is a number of well, well, you can you can simply count it as a number of countries that we have coordinated with in terms of um, solving incidents. So we have connection to uh, different parts of different certs in different parts of the world, and then we have reached out to this many um, C certs in solving incidents. However, um, other than the, for example, other than the 80 certs that we have contacted um, or uh, we have communicated in 2017, we also have other. Um, we have we were also connected to other certs. Um, um, this is just a number of uh, the cases that we have handled, uh, the incident handled um, with those, uh, you know, um, CCTLDs. So other than those, uh, we have inc we had had some mutual incident with. We also have other uh, certs that we can also reach out to, and these efforts uh, have been made, uh, or I, I could say. Um, we have established uh, this kind of uh, incident handling um, coordination, um, uh, co coordination uh, relations through the CSER community effort. Uh, for example, FIRST, which is the global uh, framework for the um, CERTs. Um, I believe uh, there are some uh, members um, joining from uh, Taiwan as well. And also um, AP CERT, which is the um, Asia Pacific CSER community, which is mainly um, driven by the national or leading CERTs in this region. And um, also, I'd like to mention that the JP Cert has been making a lot of efforts in capacity building as well. Um, 
I know that in, in Jeff's slides, um, the APNIC um, is also helping uh, the set setting up of the search in the region. Uh, we're also helping that kind of activity as well. So we have been to these countries listed there on the slides, um, mainly in the Asia Pacific region, um, to help out um, those uh, who w would like to set up a search or like newly established search um, with uh, some technical um, capabilities. So um, we've been doing a lot of trainings um, there as well. And yeah, um, just coming to the end, I would like to mention about the um, CSERT collaboration network. So we do, uh, this is the mem member of APCERT community, um, which is the um, Asia Pacific Computer Emergency Response Team. And we'd like to introduce that uh, we do have the collaboration mechanism within AP region. Um, at least for the uh, national or leading search to um, exchange information or uh, request for coordination when it comes to incident that requires um, help um, um, from other countries. So uh, we have a lot of uh, leading certs um, listed um, here in this um, map. Uh, we have um, three member uh, teams uh, joining from Taiwan. Um, Taiwan uh, TWN CERT and TW CERT CC and also EC CERT. Um, EC CERT is the um, the uh, CERT that is that, that take, takes care of the e-commerce um, problems um, here in Taiwan, and also JP CERT has been um, serving um, to the community for a long while. Uh, we have been the secretariat uh, since the establish establishment of this community um, in AP CERT. So this is the collaboration mechanism, and. Just this. This will be my last slide. Um, so those th those of you who are familiar with the the Paris call um, that uh, Mr. Maimura mentioned um, during the, the the first day uh, in the keynote speech, um, th I think there was a, a statement regarding the cyber hygiene, and we're also making efforts in this uh, in this aspect as well. Um, so this was last year. We have launched and released a new um, service on our uh, on our web page. This is called Mejiro, um, Internet Risk Visualization Service. Um, this um, actually, um, you know, we have uh, so sorts of data um, collected from different services, and we will we put together and to 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 make it um, easier to see um, what how much uh, risks uh, you have in each um, economy's internet uh, environment. And then you can actually make um, different kinds of uh, graphs and different statistics on, on our website. You can choose different countries and also different protocols um, that they have uh, different kinds of uh, vulnerable risks, um, for example, um, NTP and DNS, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we, have uh, we have made these uh, statistics available uh, as uh, according to the size of the IP address that, that is uh, allocated to each country. So this is um, actually uh, cross-comparable uh, between one country and, an and another. Um, the, 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 the graph on the right, this is an example of the, the comparison of Japan, Korea, and China. I mean, no, I just picked it up um, because th they're just a number of countries. But you can see the different um, sorts of uh, num numbers of the, the index um, that is um, assigned to each uh, country. And then you, you will see what, uh, what, in what protocol we have the more risk or less risk. Um, and you can also compare it like this. And the left, le left graph, you can, you can see that, uh, that the blue line uh, shows the average number. And then uh, you will be able to see um, how far um, from the average line, you're doing better or you're doing worse uh, compared to the, the, the average. So this might be, uh, we're hoping that this tool will be uh, one of the um, tools to help you actually work on the um, creating a cyber hygiene. And I mean, like a cleanup activity would be uh, one of the, um, you know, um, hopeful results uh, from this um, from this uh, tool, so this is this is accessible from the URL uh, over there. So if you're interested in, I interested about the statistics in Taiwan, um, please do access that website. So um, I think I talked enough, and I will stop here. And then this is the contact information. Um, so that's all. Thank you. I think um, JP Search is a very similar organization like TW Search. So any domestic things, uh, please do refer to TW Search, and we work well with our community as well. So uh, David, it's all yours. Sure. Um, so um, I'll spare you slides uh, this time, so um, something uh, not to read. Um, as uh, anyone in this room is probably aware, you know, ICANN uh, is uh, both a community uh, and an organization. And the ICANN uh, organization's role is to try to facilitate the work of the community. 
Um, the bylaws that ICANN uh, now works under, which were defined um, as a result of the transition of the INF functions, uh, requires the ICANN organization to uh, work to ensure the security and stability of the DNS and the, the internet system of unique identifiers. And the way we do that uh, is to work collaborati collaboratively uh, with the community uh, in order to identify areas of risk and try to address those areas um, as best we can. So ICANN has, uh, within its structure, uh, the Security Stability Advisory Committee, um, which works to provide uh, input uh, and advice uh, to the ICANN board and community about uh, risks uh, that they identify as uh, important to the security and stability of the unique, Internet's unique uh, system of identifiers. Um, we also have uh, a periodic review, uh, the Security Stability and Resiliency Review. Uh, currently, uh, the second iteration of that review is ongoing. Um, Kaveh here is the uh, board liaison to SSR2, uh, the review team. Um, and that uh, review is looking at um, the areas in which ICANN is uh, working uh, for good or ill with regards to improving the security of the Internet system of unique identifiers. Uh, also reviewing the past results of the reviews that had been done. Um, these uh, review teams are actually created from the community. Uh, as a result of the transition, the uh, review team members uh, come from the various supporting organizations and advisory uh, committees um, within uh, the ICANN community itself. Uh, and they have essentially free reign to review uh, all aspects of how uh, ICANN performs its functions. Um, outside of the ICANN community directly, uh, we also work with a variety of organizations uh, involved in something having to do with security. For example, we're members of APWG uh, and the uh, and MOG, the messaging, uh, B, uh, whatever their acronym. I, I, it's very long. I keep getting it confused. Uh, we participate in the uh, ISOI. We are a member of various um, uh, of the first and other uh, trust-based organizations uh, to try to identify security uh, issues uh, before they have an impact on the systems that ICANN helps coordinate. Within my group itself, um, my group, the Office of the CTO, um, we have a, a number of projects uh, that are aimed at working to try to improve uh, systemic security. Uh, one of those uh, is the Domain Abuse uh, Activity Reporting System, or DAR. Uh, that uh, system tries to collect information associated with uh, domain abuse um, through the new GTLD program uh, and report on that abuse to provide input and information to the community to help uh, uh, guide policy discussions uh, on those topics. Uh, right now it focuses specifically on the GTLDs, um, the generic top-level domains, uh, but we're looking to expand that to work with the registrars, uh, as well as any um, country code top-level domain that would be interested in participating with that particular project. Um, we also believe uh, that in order to um, sort of work on something, you need to be able to measure it. Uh, a result of that is a project called the Identifier Technologies Health Indicators, ITHI. Uh, TWNIC is actually participating in this uh, particular project. Uh, the intent of that is to try to define a set of metrics um, and indicators that will um, provide information about whether the health of the Internet um, is improving or uh, getting worse based on activities uh, undertaken by ICANN. Um, right now we have, uh, I believe, about uh, 32 different metrics that we're collecting. And the idea is to actually have a baseline uh, of those metrics and, and any time something changes, a policy changes, something like GDPR is implemented, we hope to be able to track uh, the impact of that change through uh, these metrics. Um, we also deploy um, root instances uh, in order to try to help improve the resiliency of the root system. Um, ICANN currently has uh, about 160 uh, instances of the root server deployed uh, around the world. Um, I believe uh, Chunghua Telecom actually operates one of the root instances here in, in Taiwan. Um, uh, as Bob had mentioned, one of the key issues is education. And one of the things my group in particular has undertaken is uh, training and capacity building. Uh, we go all over the world uh, to work with uh, various groups, particularly uh, law enforcement, governments, uh, anti-abuse communities, 
uh, internet service providers, registries, and registrars to try to provide them with information about how best to secure uh, and improve the security of uh, the, the, uh, the system of unique identifiers, provide information, particularly to law enforcement, about what it is that ICANN does and what we don't do, um, to try to help people understand the ways in which um, the internet actually works and the role that ICANN and the various uh, community members have within the internet. Um, and in the interest of time, I will uh, conclude my remarks saying that um, education is actually um, one of the most important areas of trying to address security. Um, there, all, as Jeff pointed out, the complexity of the systems that we now rely on um, has only increased and will only increase. And I think the only way that we're going to be able to uh, deal with the security threats that we have in front of us is to actually um, educate people to make them understand where, uh, what role they have in trying to secure those systems. And back to Joy. Thank you, David. I think uh, that's a good conclusion. Back to the basic when we're talking about all these wonderful things, the education, the training, the very fundamental knowledge is probably the foundation for everything when we're talking about security, because security comes in every flavor, in every forms. And uh, to work on the security community, I think there requires many different aspects. And I think it's wonderful that we have a very diverse um, panelist here. So I welcome any question from the floor, anything, comments, questions that you have heard. I think that the, it, it's wonderful to know that uh, we all care about security because yesterday we also mentioned a lot about one world, one internet. Uh, when we want to trust this internet, what do we really do? And the security is definitely one of the topic. All right, Kenny, the mic is yours. Yes, thank you, Kenny Huang, Titan Nick, and also Executive Council of APNIC. Uh, my question probably is not directly related to the security itself, but my question is related to how an institution going to be a long-term sustainable operation based on a security concept. For example, like a, we have one of panelists that probably is a commercial company, and a commercial company provides a service for reward. And, but the rest of the panelists probably uh, your organization subsidize the cost of security, either for training, either for delivering the service. Actually, the cost was subsidized by the, the mother institution. So what's the base, mo uh, what's the base model for, for long-term operation based on the security requirement? Because it's not simple demand and supply issue. It's, we need to consider long-term sustainability issue. Thank you. Good question, Kenny. And, and in some ways, I would actually say the long-term sustaining view of the internet is that it's a toxic wasteland that radiates in the dark and we can't fix it. In a world of billions of devices, where devices are built at the lowest possible cost and the highest possible volume, quality is impossible. We've had this before in our urban landscape where we live. And the response has been gated communities, where the few that are rich isolate themselves from everyone else. In the internet, the long-term ongoing future is that security is a luxury good. If you can afford it, you can put your services with Akamai, or Cloudflare, or Fastly, or any one of the few remaining giants who can afford to build a castle which is so high and the walls are so thick that the attackers can't penetrate the wall. They just absorb the attack because the attack is inevitable. Everyone else has a problem. And this is the internet that we have. And we decry the fact that the internet's being populated by just a few giants. But at the same time, the very toxic basis of the internet itself actually makes sure that only the giants can survive. Only the folk who have enough money and resources to build these giant castles that can deflect the attack actually get left. If your bank isn't served by one of these massive content houses, your bank is at risk. If your government infrastructure and so on. We're all retreating behind the castles and that's the future of the internet. A small bunch of gated communities operated by a very small number of castle operators. 
it's a terrible vision but unfortunately i suspect it's all but inevitable i ha have to say that it's um relatively unique in my experience that i get to be an optimist um <laughs> I, I i tend to uh have sort of a, a, a negative view of the world, but I think Jeff has uh, out, outstripped me this time. Um, I, I think um, part of the issue uh, that we face is that um, it's, it's a sort of a form of market failure. Um, security is um, not computed uh, in the individual's decision about uh, purchasing a product or a service. It is something that um, uh, you think about after you've been attacked, after you've had your data compromised, or your, your, uh, you find uh, your credit card numbers being used uh, to purchase things you have no interest in. Um, my experience or my understanding is that a um, typical response to market failures is uh, for the imposition of regulations. Um, so the perhaps the optimistic outlook in contravention to uh, Jeff's vision of the ap apocalyptic future um, may be that um, th we increasingly see uh, governmental mandates that say um, if you are going to attach your device to the network it must meet this basic level of certification you can't have hardwired passwords um, that are known on the internet. You have to uh, have the ability to block certain forms of traffic uh, or certain uh, floods of traffic. Um, and uh, whether or not this is mandated by law or mandated by procurement uh, processes uh, is, you know, a implementation choice. Um, but fundamentally, um, we have to figure out a way uh, to encourage people to actually understand that security is not something uh, that as a bolt-on, it has to be built from the ground up and has to be incorporated internally um, from at all levels. Uh, because if we don't, then the bad guys have the ability to, uh, to uh, take advantage of those vulnerabilities and uh, drive forward their particular agendas. Wonderful. Thank you. I wanted to add, I agree mostly with uh, David, I think there is there is a, there is an issue right now, but uh, uh, and it's not only regulation that uh, that can resolve this. There are other scenarios. If you look at, for example, electricity light bulbs, uh, insurance comes to play. So it might be required later on that uh, for for your home insurance, you need to have certified devices, for example, or for your fire insurance for whatever reason, security insurance if you have. Uh, they say, oh, you need to have devices with with uh, these markings, otherwise uh, your, your uh, premium will be much higher. So people will want to buy devices which have minimum compliance. So it's not only government forces, sometimes markets can, can, can even self-correct. So uh, I think my, my personal uh, view of the future, I think, yes, we, we have issues, but the way market will correct is actually via this, this uh, free market methods, which is, for example, yeah, insurance is a good example that that will impose requirements, and then manufacturers that would be in their their best interest to comply with those requirements. And yeah, yeah one additional way um, may be uh, liabilities. So uh, a, you know, if you develop software or products or services um, that result in a huge loss, you may be subject to some portion of that loss. It's market. It's a point oh, I'm sorry. Let me say in response that they were perfectly good baby web monitors. <laughs> the camera was great. The microphone was perfect. It did exactly what it said it was going to do. It's just that it did a bit more. And each baby webcam monitor did not invoke disaster. They only sent a couple of packets a second that were wrong. Orchestrating millions of it to do it at the same time was the issue. Was the baby webcam monitor the problem? Some would say <laughs> yes, but I would actually say no, it was a baby webcam monitor. And that it was actually the context and machinery that turned it into something evil and ugly. And so it's not as simple in my mind as <laughs> regulating the product. Because in some ways, it's the environment in which the product is deployed that causes our problems, not that the product does a few DNS queries. Yeah, but if, if as a citizen you're uh, uh, liable for 
publishing any photo of a baby without permit or whatever, something like that, then you will take care of buying which device you select All and you will look into any kind of credentials on the device that, hey, this actually protects you from that and, it, and the manufacturer is, in, is insured. So if you're... It, it didn't leak pictures. It didn't do anything wrong. It just sent no, a couple I'm of DNS queries I'm just trying to, to say, as, as an example, And, and so, as I said, it's not that the product was bad. The product was perfectly good and fit for purpose. It just had a few extra features. Okay. I think we may ha need another <laughs> session for the baby <laughs> monitor. But uh, let's turn the, the open mic to uh, Paul was first. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thanks. Uh, unlike, uh, unlike Jeff, I'm, uh, <laughs> well, I'm not such a pessimist. Um, but I, I think there are... Um, there are concrete developments which are underway at the moment which give us some reason for optimism. Um, the IETF is working on standards for software upgrade of so-called IoT devices, of, of connected things. Um, there's something called MUD, uh, manufacturer, usage, manufacturer Usage Description Standard for manufacturers to build in a, um, a standardised way for devices to declare what they intend to do so your baby monitor can tell the home gateway that all it is expecting to do is to send pictures and not to be accessing the web or or, um, or other TCP IP ports and so on. I, th I think um, that's this is about the extent of my knowledge of these developments but my understanding is that there's quite a bit underway that gives us some some cause for for hope that at least at least we are uh, maintaining pace. So I'd, maybe some of the panellists know about these developments and we could talk a bit more about what concretely is coming rather than all the disasters that have, have <laughs> uh, undeniably <laughs> happened so far. Let me just do a quick feedback. I think for the IP camera in Taiwan that there, the government agency does have uh, some kind of regulation. So <laughs> the basic requirement needs to be done. <laughs> However, this project was a part of this IoT security guideline. So um, IP camera was just the first mm -hmm. and probably one of the most important one, uh, just to update for the audience. And uh, let me just uh, turn this to. Uh, yeah, this is go away again. And I think uh, I have uh, just uh, one comment and uh, one, you know, question. I don't want to jump into the debate and the argue with all of you, you know, <laughs> because uh, we can spend hour, hour to talking about that. I think the first comment is, uh, we usually say one world, one internet, but to be honest, I don't believe it. Because uh, one world, one internet is uh, broken already. You know, right now in the world, you can see more and more people, you know, look, particularly the government is already hand in. So let one war, one internet, it's not there anymore. There's a first point, it's a comment, okay? <laughs> and you want to debate, I'm fine. <laughs> the second ball is, uh, in here we're talking about security, the internet security. To be honest, the internet security is uh, massive, it's wide, it's really difficult to say, you know, which part is a security. And uh, here is a question for you is, uh, I really like to know is uh, as a government or as a nation like uh, in Taiwan or any, any com countries, if you want to do something about the security, what is the first three things you think about have to do, you know? F for example, like a DNS, for example, a routing security, you know, because uh, at least as I know, uh, in some of the countries, spend too much time playing the game like a hackathon, you know? <laughs> I think this is just a game, it's a security game. It's not a really security at all, you know? But routing is really a, a serious problem, you know? And routing, how we can do it, make it really better and uh, in, in a much reliable way because uh, we see a lot of routing fault and routing problems, and they actually is uh, much serious to impact to the, you know, the, the country or the society securities. But in generally, the routing actually is not really uh, the people or the government or the industry really put the eyes on. 
you know, they thought about, well, if, if the packet can go through God, thanks, you know, that's already is a good news, you know. So it's difficult to figure out, you know, how, how to really put the security, you know, in the routing, in because uh, particularly for Taiwan, a lot of uh, problem, the traffic actually from China. And how we can make sure our routing is uh, not go through the China, you know, and and really can s secure or forget about the China. You say the country X, <laughs> you know, just like uh, you know, you remember the Snowden uh, issue happened. I think you heard that the Germ Germany Prime Minister he said he want to build a Europe net, but actually. It's not that simple because in the business way you're thinking about it. In many cases, actually, you routing to the U.S. and coming back is cheaper and faster, and that is a very difficult decision. You know, you want to go routing somewhere else and coming back is uh, easy and faster, or another better way to do it. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just say that um, uh, with regards to your last question uh, regarding uh, how to um, secure or how to ensure your routing does what you think it does is that um, you can't. You just simply can't. Um, if you want security, if you want to ensure that the data that you are transiting um, over the network is protected, you have to use end-to-end -end security. You have to be, um, you have to encrypt it on systems that you control, that you trust, and decrypt it on systems that your uh, communication partner uh, controls and trust. Anything else is reliant upon the kindness of strangers um, and the internet, uh, the, the way it was designed, the packets can go pretty much any direction you might think it could possibly go, and it frequently does. Um, so, uh, yeah, end-to-end -end encryption is probably your, your best bet, as painful as that is. You know, I don't think there's a security answer. It's not that governments aren't doing something that they should. I'd like to be optimistic about that, but there's no hope for that. <laughs> but what can governments do? Oddly enough, much the same as the private security consultants make it easier to attack someone else than attack you. Make sure that you're doing as good as you can to make it harder to attack. Name registrations in TW should be protected by multi-factor authentication. You shouldn't just have passwords. That's crazy in this day and age. DNS validation should, DNSSEC validation should be in all of your DNS infrastructure in this country. You should be running secure, capable resolvers in the DNS and not forcing the DNS traffic to go out of the country. These are basic steps that at least make it easier to attack someone else than attack your national infrastructure. Can't stop the attack, can make it harder to attack inside. You should also encourage the castle builders to come and build castles in here. Because if our real defense right now is to build massive, content castles, then build them. Because if that's the best answer we have, encourage it. Don't just decry it, but let it happen. So I think there are measures that government and public infrastructure can do in terms of practices in the namespace, practices in your address space, that put in our best practice with cryptography, multi-factor authentication, those basic things, and get that right. Won't stop the attack, but the attack's going to go elsewhere because it's easier there. That's the best you can hope. So you mean the drop of the eight point or eight point or eight point eight? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am gonna be um, asking our panelists. I know that uh, I would like to leave the last ten seconds, maybe at the end of the session, to answer one of the comments uh, from our audience. That what is the first thing you will do for the security? Okay, so think about that, and we use that as a closing before I get to um, our perhaps the last question from the open mic. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Andrew Chen from Taiwan Institute of Economic Research. Uh, I have two questions. So first is, what is the most difficult uh, in your uh, business to promote, uh, to let everyone to understand what you talk about security in to, uh, 
your customers? What is the most difficult part? And the second one is uh, when we talk about inclusive in the internet. So we also talk about the affordable, affordable, uh, affordable uh, equipment, equipment to everyone, and especially for the best of the py py uh, pyramid people. So, uh, but they are also cheap, but sometimes with dangerous and threat. So how to make everyone to use affordable equipment to uh, access the internet? And that's my question, thank you. Well, uh, I try to answer the first question you raised uh, about uh, the difficult, what's the most difficult things to communicate with the people about uh, cybersecurity. Actually, um, uh, I, I think uh, in the uh, cybersecurity committee or the cybersecurity administrator uh, in uh, commercial sector or government agency, it's easy. The most difficult part is how to convince the big boss, okay, the CEO, the the government head, because uh, for them, you know, the security is the, you know, kind of a, like a burden because there's nothing good for their productivity. They, the, the, their mindset is always how to grow my revenue, my profit. So security is the last thing they, they will think about it. But uh, uh, however, the things are getting, you know, the, the thing situation is changing because the, uh, at the end, the, the cyber threat actually will, will make the, the productivity come to zero. So this is the timing. Uh, the high-level people start to think about that. But uh, how to communicate to you know that kind of people? They don't have any concept about security, even you know the IT stuff. So how to communicate that is the most difficult. However, I think it's the most uh, most important thing we need to do. Okay. Yeah, I guess in the interest of time, we can probably have a lot of the discussion of s of our. And I just want to say that. Um, I love security, and that's why we're here. And uh, um, why don't we go back to around the table that what do you think is the most important thing or the first thing that you do when you're thinking about security? Dave, you want to give a quick answer? So I guess first thing, I guess, is just be um, uh, more aware, more aware of the the implications of the choices that you're making in terms of the products and services you're buying, more uh, aware of the risks uh, that you have uh, around you, um, and uh, the ways of mitigating those risks. Thank you, David and Bob. I I also think the awareness is the and also education is the most uh, important, most critical, and the first thing we need to do. Okay, I know Jeff is gonna give a two hour answer, but he's gonna <laughs> cut it down to 10 seconds. But I love to hear his answer. <laughs> Own the solution in your national community. Everyone is working on this. Google is working on this. Amazon's working on this. They will create outcomes that they own and you will be a consumer. If that's what you want, do nothing, and that's what's gonna happen. The DNS will disappear in behind browsers. Content will disappear in behind Akamai's caches. The internet will be taken off you as a national community. If you don't want that, own the problem yourselves. Mm -hmm. Train, engage, encourage, and act. Someone's going to act, and if you don't, others will, and you'll be treated like a consumer. The choice is yours. Okay, Yoka. Well, I would say the um, collaboration would be the key um, in, in security uh, because you cannot really uh, solve a single um, incident only by yourself um, since the internet is supported by different uh, stakeholders um, uh, like domains, IP address, network, um, everything is combined. So um, when, you, when, you have an, when you're in trouble, um, you need help um, from those different stakeholders uh, in order to solve problems. So um, have a lot of good connection and uh, you know working relationship with the different stakeholders um, collaboration will be the uh, one of the keys um, in security I believe 
Wonderful. I want to thank all the panelists who comes from all different areas, very diversified the answers. I love it. And I love security. So I'm going to give my last comment. I think that uh, Jeff mentioned earlier, security is a luxury word in the past. Probably today still is. But I think what it refers to is that there is a price you have to pay for the security. And that, that's just the, the fundamental of it. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I took a lot of your um, coffee break time. So um, let this uh, session close at this uh, adjourn. Thank you. Uh, so now it's a uh, coffee break. We will have a 10 minute coffee break. The next session will begin at 23, 11.23. 下一场会议因为现现在会议延误，所以我们待会会延到十一点二十三分举行。那请各位如果背面的问，如果您的卡片背面有卡扣了，可以用您的手机扫描之后填答问卷，然后到我们的注册桌这边换取小礼品。